Hi, Sarah. Hi. How, how are you doing? doing? Good. How are you? Good. So we just heard a panel about folks who are shopping based on their, their values, that they really care about companies who export their values through their products. Yeah. Um, talk about how purpose and values play a role um, at MM LaFleur. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I think I am the last person standing between you and lunch. So uh, <laughs> we'll try to make this fun and lively. Um, Oh, so purpose driven. I think you could say that I got into this business because I myself see myself as my customer. Um, we are a clothing brand for busy working women or purposeful women, as we like to say. Um, and actually, when I was pitching investors initially, they would say, like, I don't really understand the need for this business. And so uh, maybe I could actually ask you all to to, to help you understand why uh, brands like us exist. Um, first, I, I'm going to ask the men in the room how long it took you to get ready this morning. Um, just raise your hand. Uh, so if it took you 15 minutes, raise your hand. Less. Less. OK, do we have like five <laughs> minutes in the audience? Oh, lots of hands in five minutes. Good job, gentlemen. Uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, Lucky 45 place. minutes, an hour. No, an hour and a half, no takers. OK, um, I will now ask the women in the audience if it took you under 15 minutes to get ready this morning. Please stand up. That's amazing. Well done. Well done. No, that's really round of applause. 30 minutes. Yeah, more hands going up. 45 minutes, an hour. That's me this morning since I got my hair blown out for all of you. Um, an hour and a half, anyone? Two hours? <laughs> um, so, okay, it's, this is an impressive group, I'll, I'll, I have to say. Um, when I usually ask this question, I see the most number of hands for women go up at about an hour to an hour and a half. For men, 15 minutes or less. Um, there's actually a study that says women on average spend 15 more days getting ready for work compared to men a year. 15 more days. So I just want you to imagine <laughs> what you would do with 15 more days a year, go on vacation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when I think of my company and how it serves this purpose, really my goal is to help my customers get out of the house as quickly as possible in the mo morning by providing clothing that goes together, that's seamless, that's machine washable, that's wrinkle resistant, so you're not having to pull out your ironing board uh, at 7.55 a.m. when you have to leave the house at 8. I'm sure many of us have been there. Um, so, so that's really how I think of ourselves as a purpose-driven brand. Um, you know, we say that our, our, we believe in a world where when women succeed, the world is a better place. Um, and that's a very grand mission statement that we're putting out there. But the way we contribute to that is by providing incredible clothing. Absolutely. You have a background in finance. What yeah. is your relationship to fashion? How did you? Uh, like, really no relationship. I never thought I would go into retail. Um, my mother worked in fashion. She worked in, uh, for a luxury brand uh, based out of Tokyo and Paris. And so I think in some ways, the apple did not fall far from the tree. But she was the odd one out in my family. Most of my family, uh, they were civil servants, worked in government. My dad was a State Department employee for 37 years. So I thought I was going to follow in his footsteps. Um, but I, I was working in management consulting and then in finance. And I myself experienced this problem of staring into my closet. And I mean, I, I would think to myself, like, God, I've got nothing to wear even though I had a closet full of clothes. And so um, I was working in private equity. Uh, it was a really hard job. I was one of two women out of 170 front office employees. Um, it, I decided that it wasn't the place for me. And so I, I basically quit on a whim. And uh, I didn't really know what to do with my life at that point. Uh, this was when I was 27. And I feel like I had ruined my resume in perpetuity. Um, and it was kind of at that point where I was thinking, OK, well, I've always had this idea for better workwear for working women. Maybe now would be the chance to give it a try. And so that's how I ended up starting it. Were you thinking about your own closet, lots of pants, suits, and jackets? How, were, how did totally. you think about the, <laughs> the makeup of the clothes? I mean, it was, um, I think one thing that really struck me was the dry cleaning bill. So I, uh, <laughs> I, I hear laughter in the audience, you know, dry cleaning, one day someone's got to fight this fight, but it's an extremely sexist industry. So um, just think <laughs> about the dress. OK, uh, you know, the women in the audience know, like, if you take your dress to dry cleaning, it's minimum, you know, $12. In New York, I think it averages 15 to $20 now versus a men's shirt that's $5. And by the way, the amount of fabric that each 
piece of clothing uses is approximately the same. So why are women getting charged triple, quadruple for it? Um, and I had this dress that I loved. It was a, a simple shift dress and I wore it all the time. And I, I think I paid almost $300 for it, but I realized after four years of owning that dress, I had actually paid $1,250 to take care of that dress. Um, so I think those were a lot of the things that I was honing in on. Um, and when I initially met my creative director, Miyako, yes, you can rest assured, I am not the designer. Um, I, I just control the money as I like to say. Um, so my, my creative director, Miyako, she was the former head designer at Zach Posen. She had worked with Jason Wu, came from this really illustrious fashion background. And when I first met her, I was saying, you know, don't you know these women who walk to work in flats and they have these, you know, huge longchamp bags that like they basically carry their life around in this bag. <laughs> and when they get into the elevator, they switch out from their flats to their heels. And she went, no, I've never met anyone like that in my life. Uh, <laughs> So I just thought that was like, that was such an aha moment for me, seeing the big disconnect between the fashion designers and the people who, who think, who dream about what working women were like. I remember her saying like, I thought you wanted to show like a little bra strap, you know, to keep it sexy. And I was like, oh God, no, like that's the last thing you want to be doing at work. And so a lot of it came from, <laughs> yes. Sorry, I just, I just fell right into that one. Um, but uh, I think um, it, a lot of what I'm doing is just trying to put my customers in front of my fashion designers. My, my design team is really an incredible team. I've got um, people, designers from Calvin Klein, The Row, Stella McCartney, Jason Wu, you know, really like the who's who of fashion and now working at MM designing for these women. But really like my biggest job is I think putting these designers um, in front of my customers uh, who are for the most part, you know, working in offices or um, our moms who are really busy and have to be running around all the time and making sure that they understand their concerns. Like that, that's really my, my main responsibility. You talked earlier about female empowerment, right? Yes. That you were one of two women in your office place and presumably for some of the women that you're working with, that's also their reality. Reality. How are you empowering them kind of in the styling process? Oh, thank you for asking that. Um, so I, if I talk about my customers, I have customers who are congresswomen, senators, um, CEOs of big companies, anchors of, you know, big news sites. And I've worked a lot with some of them um, personally. And I think one thing that strikes me is they are so confident and so intelligent and so sure of themselves in many aspects of their lives. But often when it comes to clothing, they're like, uh, I don't know, does blue go with navy and um <laughs> you know it's, it's just like one of those questions where you're like uh you know as someone who likes fashion and who, who loves fashion you're like of course they go together but um I, I just see how many women don't actually don't care about it i shouldn't say don't care about it it's not their primary priority you know they're not pouring over the pages of vogue thinking like "Ooh, what's happening on the runway this season they're like <laughs> my goal is to get out of the door as fast as i possibly can and hopefully i look stylish when i step into the office and so um really what i think we're trying to do is is help these women saying like you 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 do your job so well we do this part of the job really well so let us help you um in stores in our stores uh, usually what our customers do is they they have a one-on-one -on -one appointment with our stylist it's 60 minutes we don't have any merchandise on the floor. Uh, so the stylist pre pulls these items for our customers to try. And we say, okay, these are the items that we think are going to work for you. We want to make this the most efficient hour of your life. We only want to see you in the showroom four times a year. Um, and let's get, let's go on your way. Um, it's not really meant to be this, uh, let's overwhelm you with merchandise. It's meant to be, okay, here are the five things that we're going to give you. And here are the 20 ways you can wear them. Absolutely. When I think about shopping, I'm the kind of person where I'm like, both, I have nothing to wear and ugh, I still hate shopping. It, yes. <laughs> and it seems yes. like that's a similar sentiment to some of your customers. So what, yes. what exactly is it about shopping that they dislike? You mentioned being overwhelmed. Is it, is it that like having to go through too many racks or? I mean, decision paralysis is I think a huge part of it. I can just tell you from personal experience when I was a working woman and you know, Mondays through Fridays, like I'm just too exhausted by the time I get out of work. By the way, you, usually I wasn't getting out before midnight. So Bloomingdale's is closed by then. Um, and then on the weekends, I would roll into Bloomingdale's or Nordstrom's on Sunday. Uh, I would be there with all the other tourists. I'm coming through racks and racks and racks. I find the one shirt that I think works from the front. And then I turn it around and I see a big gaping hole in the back. So I was like, well, I cannot wear this to work. Um, 
and, and so I think that's an experience that a lot of working women, that, that resonates with a lot of uh, working women. Um, there was a piece that Fast Company had wrote a, written about us called This is the Brand for Women Who Hate to Shop, and that article went viral. And I think a lot of women were saying, I'm the woman who hate to shop. Um, <laughs> but I think a lot of other, other retailers, department store leaders were, were saying to us, like, that's, that's not true. Like, women love to shop. It's a social activity. This is how um, they like to spend their weekends. And, uh, you know, maybe that's true for certain categories of clothing, uh, but I think for the majority of women, workwear shopping has been something that they hate. Uh, they would much rather be doing something else. And I think we're trying to bring joy into that process by making it as easy as possible. There's a digital aspect to this, this as well. Shopping sure. feels like a lot of a, a very physical experience. Obviously, you're putting clothes on bodies. How, how are you thinking about customizing that and using the kind of digital tools that you use in your business model? We, um, I think one thing that maybe makes us different from uh, some of the more, I don't want to say digital first brands, but maybe algorithm driven brands. Um, we don't want our customers to feel like there is a machine working in the background um, trying to figure out what works best on you. I, I think for me, I always prefer to interact with a human. Like if I'm in a dressing room, I don't want to have to touch an iPad to get someone to bring me a size six instead of a size four. Um, I would just rather say like, can you bring me a size six and just have someone bring me a size six. And so we have a lot of technology in the background that aids our stylist. Um, the way I like to explain it um, to my investors, it's, it's, it's often like a financial advisor, a financial advisor, you want to be able to interact with them face to face and actually um, hear their feedback. But the financial advisor might be using tools in the background to help you just help, help understand what would work best for that customer. And that's how a lot of our stylists operate as well. And so when you're talking, when you're talking about bringing size sixes and, and interfacing with these designers, the thing that I'm thinking about is inclusivity. Yes. So who is, this is a very Project Runway oh, I love question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is the MM LaFleur woman? And is, is, are the sizes that are available inclusive for everyone? I know you talked about Congresswomen and yes. um, senators and yes. all of that, but the, the range of bodies that you would have to dress yes. seems like a wide range. I know. And actually coming, so I primarily grew up in Japan and I, you know, when you go to Japan, you'll see everyone is very small. And uh, I walked into a retailer once and they had three sizes. So I was like, God, skew management in this business must be so easy. But it's, real, it's not the case in America. We've got a lot of different sizes, a lot of different um, proportions. Uh, so that's something that we've been really focused on since day one. Uh, we serve from zero P, so that's zero petite, all the way up to what we call three plus, which is the equivalent of roughly 24W. And so that's a really wide range uh, that we're, we're serving, um, especially a wide range for a startup like us. I think that's, you know, those are moves that you see companies like Banana Republic or Ann Taylor making. Actually, I don't think they've gone... And Ann Taylor, I know, does a lot of petites, but not necessarily, um, I think, a lot on the, on the plus sides. Don't quote me on that. I don't, I don't want to um, say that. But J. Crew, I know that, that for sure. And then I think for us, it felt like we can't say that we're serving all purposeful women without actually offering plus sizes. You know, I mean, a lot of our executives that we serve are plus, si in plus size. And what we've seen with our customers is that we actually have equal age distribution between ages 25 and 55. Um, that's one of our points that we're really, really proud of. I think there are very few brands out there that say, okay, we're for a wide range of customers, as opposed to saying like, we're for the millennials or we're for the teenagers or, you know, we're for retirees. Um, we see a lot of moms shopping with daughters or daughters saying, this is the one brand where my mom and I share clothes. And, and we actually love that about our, our customers. So when you're working with fashion, um, the people in the fashion industry, they're sometimes resistant to um, dressing folks of different sizes, right? That's a, that's a stereotypical problem in fashion at large. <laughs> Are you having those conversations with the designers that you work with and, and have they been mostly receptive to the efforts that you're making? I think um, that's one thing where Miyako is, uh, Miyako, my, my creative director is just, uh, she's so unlike your typical designer. I mean, if you can imagine, see, she used to design for the runway and would dress Natalie Portman for the Golden Globes and that kind of, you know, she was that kind of designer. And I, I think she felt at some point, um, like anything she made wouldn't actually end up on a real person. Um, so she had never actually seen her clothes in the wild, as we like to say. And uh, I I think when um, I still remember that moment when, when she and I were walking down Soho together and we saw 
our dresses on, uh, on a customer. Um, it was just down Prince Street. And she was like, oh my god, I've never seen a piece that I've designed being worn by an actual woman walking down the street. And uh, <laughs> you know, I think it was just that magical moment for her where it suddenly clicked. And so she loves, loves, loves designing for these women. And we do these VIP dinners where uh, you know, we'll have someone from the astrophysics department from University of Washington sitting next to um, someone who is a human rights advocate, sitting next to someone who's an anchor at NPR. And I think she sees these women and she was like, I can't believe that I get to design for these kinds of women. So uh, it's, it's not sexy by traditional retail and fashion standards. Um, you know, I, I think I, my goal always is that I, I tell her one day I'm going to have you win a CFDA, although I think the fashion world almost doesn't know what to do with us. They're like, they're a tech business. And then the tech world is like, they're a fashion business. So we're, we're you know, like the ugly stepchild uh, by, by both industries. But um, <laughs> I think she, she really brings her talents to dressing the women who are walking down the street. And, and that is something, you know, I'm extremely proud of. I have one last question before we yes. take it to questions. Um, many retailers are embracing e-commerce. They're closing their brick and mortar stores and they're um, moving digitally and you're kind of running in the opposite direction. Yes. You're opening showrooms yes. all across the country. What's the thinking behind that? You know, the truth is I think we just always saw traction with our retail stores. Um, we had the benefit of being maybe a year or two behind the Bonobos and the Warby Parkers of the world. And they were always saying like, we'll never open brick and mortar. We'll never open brick and mortar. And then lo and behold, they started opening brick and mortar. And so um, wh even when we were in the, we, are, we had this tiny 700 square foot office above a methadone clinic in the garment district. Um, and I mean, it was not a place where you wanted to bring your customers. You know, there were mice running around and all that. Um, but <laughs> Every now and then we would say customers like come on over and try try on our clothes and I, I mean if you just want to talk numbers the basket size was always higher I mean the conversion rate was always close to 100 percent and so we saw the magic of that versus online um, you know if, if a size is not working for a customer then she can easily get frustrated return the product and never try you again and so I think I've always just believed in the power of that I think for us the question is how do we do it in a financially responsible way I mean new, that's why in New York we ended up not taking on ground floor retail you know our our showroom slash store is on uh, it's on 42nd between 6th and 7th Avenue but we're on the 13th floor and so the rent is just just much, much more sustainable. Um, we have another. We had another showroom in in NoHo, and now we're actually for the first time we're going to try a ground floor location um, at Brookfield Mall. Uh, whereas in other locations, we've got eight stores um, across the country. We've we've tried brick and mortar uh, ground floor, and uh, the rents. I mean, the rent in some of these areas, it's like $2,000, $3,000. And so we've just been much more opportunistic about it. Um, we have we try to sign on short-term leases as much as possible. Um, the five to 10-year leases scare the hell out of us. Um, so we're always looking for, uh, I guess, what you could call pop-up spaces that we end up actually using as stores. Question in the back. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a veterinarian. Hi. Hi. Um, I've got an 85 pound dog. <laughs> so I love your MO. And one of the things that I'm a five minute getting dressed person. Yes. Mostly because I can. I wear scrubs at work. I can come in sweatpants. It's not a big deal for me. Um, I feel like a slob. I hate it. Mostly because the other option is to dress in really nice clothes that I don't want to get dirty and I'm on the floor all the yeah. time. Yes. I would love for you to market to us. I would love to market to you. <laughs> um, We're mostly women in our field. Yes. Um, and I feel like most of us look like this. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'm sure your primary concern is how do I not get dog hair and cat hair all over your clothes? To look, um, to look professional, and yeah, and, but not to wear to wear clothes that are easy to clean. Yes, and I don't feel bad about getting dirty. I, I completely understand. Um, I think one thing we're also seeing just generally, I mean, when I say we, we dress working women, I think even five years ago, what people would imagine is someone wearing a blazer and a skirt and they're going to the courthouse or something. But the truth is most of our customers, um, they want, well, a lot of our customers, first of all, you know, they work in we work spaces. They have much more flexible lifestyles, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're wearing a jean, jeans and a hoodie uh, to work. Actually, we had one customer, she's like, you know, a, a very well-paid executive in San Francisco. And she says, I make a ton of money. Like 
I don't want to wear a sweatshirt to work. And so um, we, we actually really started designing with customers like that in mind. We have um, our best selling product for the past three years has been this pant called the Foster Pant, which I asked Miyako, um, my creative director to make because um, I said I wanted yoga pants that look like work pants. Um, so, you know, the creativity she, she did there, she got rid of the um, seam in the front. I think one of my things with, with work pants often you, like leaves a line at the end of the day after sitting, uh, you know, for 12 hours at your desk. And so that pant has been a bestseller both for our um, women in tech as well as the women working in law firms. And I think it would be great for someone who has a more active lifestyle. Um, we also do a lot of machine washable. And um, this, for example, is machine washable. Um, I didn't have to dry clean it. I didn't have to iron it. Um, we do a lot of those kinds of pieces. Uh, so please check us out. If you even give me your email, I will, um, I will send you a referral code. Yes. <laughs> well, Sarah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.